Here they are, your IPL powerless. A day late, but probably also a dollar short. The top two teams look a clear step apart. And I couldn't tell you who the third team is with any confidence. And if you told me that Guy Quad's thumb was completely busted, I'm not even sure who I would then select as the second team. I'm losing a lot of energy when it comes to Gujarat as their bowling seems to be almost completely falling apart, but it could just be a form thing. And by this time in the season, I usually have a lot of questions answered. But at this stage, I'm just as confused thinking, is it possible that Delhi could McGurk their way into third? How on earth have we ended up here? So here is my power list in its messy, crazy glory. If you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a two-year contract with a discount, plus four extra months, plus gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a blocker protects the stumps with Nord VPN today. Rajasthan Royals won versus Mumbai and won at LSG. They got exactly what they needed from the last couple of matches. Actually, their bowling managed to restrict both of those teams to under 200s and their batters chased it pretty comfortably. Jaiswal scored a match-winning done and Dhruv Jarrell played, I think, one of the better innings I've seen in some time. And Sanju Sampson didn't go out in either game. The power play batting has been below par, which is going to be weird because, like, Butler and Jaiswal... But they've been scoring at 8.2 runs and over off the bat, and they're losing 1.33 wickets each innings. It's just not going as well as you would expect. However, individually, it's going absolutely fine, right? Because they're making big hundreds. They should just keep making hundreds. Middle overs, very good. Riyam Prague has been a revelation, and Samson has continued to bat very well, even, you know, after the start of the season. So far, Samson is averaging 111 while striking at 161. And obviously, Butler and Joe well, by making hundreds, have also been quite dominant in that part of the game. Their death overs have been absolutely elite. Hetmeyer, Parag, and Samson have scored over 50 runs at more than two runs per ball in the final overs. Butler has 56 of 29 as well. Robin Powell has only faced 10 balls, but he's scored 27 runs and been dismissed twice. So he's smacking them. They have a big road schedule ahead. They are at Sunrisers, Delhi, and CSK. But they have pretty much already qualified for the playoffs. However, to absolutely guarantee a second chance in the playoffs, they should win two of these. But if they go one and two here, there'll probably be some people who think they're not doing particularly well. But everything considered, it's probably still fine. CSK lost versus LSG, and they won versus Sunrisers. Both of those games were at home. They scored 210 and 212 in the first innings. A Marcus Stoyne special was what cost them in the first game, but they defeated the Sunrisers by a massive amount and actually ended up with a pretty good net run rate. Their power play batting is below par. They started with Ratchan Ravindra and he's already gone, right? They now have an opening partnership of Gaikwad and Rahane, with Gaikwad some notwithstanding. And Gaikwad over the last couple of games has been absolutely ridiculous, but... Rahane is just not working. His form of last season has not come. In the middle overs, they've been good. Shivam Dubé has been fantastic, and Guy Quad has obviously batted, well, everywhere, because no one can get him out. Dubé's been hitting a six every nine balls, and a boundary every 4.5 balls, which is elite. Guy Quad has continued to strike quite well in the middle, and Daryl Mitchell, well, he's not been all that good, but he looked a little bit better in the last game against the Sunrisers. Their death overs have been very good, partly because Emma Stoney has faced 37 balls, where he's made 96 runs, and he has not yet been dismissed. Shivan Dubey has 115 runs at a strike rate of 195 as well. There's a bit of a question mark over Mitchell and Jadeja, who haven't really got going in that part of the game. Their upcoming fixtures are home and away versus Punjab, and then away at Gujarat. They really have to go 2-1 and one here, at very least. And a lot of this might be down to injuries. And to be honest, you look at this and you think, they should be aiming for 3-0. KKR, they lost versus Punjab when almost no one else could have. And they won versus Delhi. Quite easily, but even that was rough. I mean, if you look at these last two games, they've played two teams fairly low down, and they completely bossed the one against Delhi, and against Punjab, they lost what a game they should have won. Does that mean that they're great? Does that mean that they're not great? I don't actually know how I feel about them at all at the moment. But their power play batting, that is elite, right? Sun on Orion and Phil Sol, I don't fully understand it. I don't understand how it continues to work, especially the Sun on Orion part. But they're very consistent at their slogging at the top of the order, and it is working 
magnificently well. And in the middle overs, they continue to be the best. Nine has a strike rate of 197 in the middle overs while still averaging 29. This has created a massive difference between them and everyone else in this tournament. And of course, Phil Salt has been striking at 176 as well. When Andre Russell comes in, he's striking at 173. And all of this makes up for the fact that Shreyas R has faced the most balls, but he scored 183 runs at a strike rate of just 125. As long as they keep having these madmen around smacking at Everest, Shreyas I can bat at pretty much any rate he wants. And their death overs, you would assume that that's also awesome, but I've got kind of more of a mixed feeling about that. Shreyas Iyer has actually had a strike rate of 263, but he's made 63 runs and been dismissed four times. Andre Russell has 89 runs at a strike rate of 202. That's good, but not good for Andre Russell. Rinku Singh has averaged 17 with a strike rate of 197. So you look at all that and you think to yourself, well, they must be doing pretty well. But they're losing so many wickets that it isn't quite working the way that it should be for them. In their next three games, they have home and away against Mumbai and they're at LSG. You would assume that their batting lineup against Mumbai's bowling should be enough to win them those games. And if they do that, that's probably enough. But I'm really interested in the Lucknow game. I want to see how they go against a good quality opposition who's also trying to sneak themselves into the finals. The Sunrisers Hyderabad lost two games in a row, which will upset all the people who've been telling me that I've been rating them too low all the way through the season. But this is kind of what I expected to happen. They had a loss at home versus RCB and a loss at CSK. And both of them were chasing. Essentially what the problem is, is kind of what we always thought it was going to be. They can't do anything at all with the ball, right? And so they have to keep batting absolutely awesome. And when you've got six or seven players in career best form, that works, but when they stop or even just go back to normal, it just doesn't look as good. Their power play batting is the best. Travis Head and Abhishek Sharma have been just incredible. Their average power play score has been 68.3, which jumps up to 73.4 when they actually bat first. And that, oh, and I should say, that's just the runs off the bat. There's been a few wides because no one wants to bowl to them. Their middle overs weirdly have been kind of par. I think a big reason for this has been Aiden Markram, who scored 122 runs at an average of 25 with a strike rate of 122 in those middle overs. He's really weighed them down, even as the rest of the team has been steamrolling towards 300. But part of the reason Markram has been doing that is because they have been losing a lot of wickets between overs 7 and 11. But Heinrich Klaassen and Nitesh Reddy have been really, really good in this middle period. Their death overs have been excellent. Klaassen and Samad have scored at mind-boggling rates in the last four overs. And it feels like Heinrich Klaassen has barely even started this tournament yet. He has a strike rate of 255 at the death, while Samad is at 233. And Shabazz Ahmed has also been useful, scoring 99 runs at 33 and a strike rate of 187. And that includes a couple of times when he's actually been batting for net run rate. They've got upcoming games at home versus Rajasthan, at Mumbai, and then at home again versus LSG. If they can manage to split the Rajasthan and LSG games at home, which seems very doable, and beat Mumbai away, then they're in a very good position. But it is also possible they go one and two here, and what they will end up being is an incredibly dangerous team who is a 50-50. Think about how we all feel about the Sunrisers at the moment, having watched them bat. Then have a look at their net run rate. How is it possible for them to bat as incredibly as they have and their bowlers to still cough up that many runs? Luck now Super Giants this week. They won at CSK, which was big, but they lost versus Rajasthan. Those were two tough games and they managed to get the highest successful chase in the process. It's also worth remembering, even against Rajasthan, they had them 78 for three at one stage before Samson and Jarrell completely swung that game around. The other way of looking at it is they don't seem to want to bowl Ravi Bishnoi in some games and honestly their bowling is not that great. Their power play batting has been below par. Only KO Roll has done well scoring 187 runs averaging 62 at a strike rate of 143. It's not quite peak KL but we can't really complain because the rest of the batters combined have 242 runs at an average of 19 and a strike rate of 125. They really are a very anchory team with QDK and KL at the top so they kind of need both of them to make runs. Their middle overs though have been very good. Puran has scored 100 162 runs, averaging 54 at a strike rate of 156, and Stoinis, 161 runs, an average of 32 at 158. And Kao Raul has managed to really attack in those middle overs as well with a strike rate of 148. In fact, when de Kock stays in, he's also done well there. So at the moment, it looks like with those four guys, they have that middle session completely covered. Of course, to keep that going, they have to make sure that they don't lose too many early wickets. At the death, they've been below par. Puran looks in great form in this tournament until he gets to the death, and suddenly he just can't score at the rate that he normally would. 179 is okay, but it's not like okay if you're Nicholas Puran. 
Kroonar has 57 runs off 39 balls without getting out. He probably hasn't scored quick enough, although he's been in in some weird situations so far. But realistically, they would expect a little bit more out of him. Their upcoming games are versus Mumbai and KKR, and then at Sunrisers. They have a 3-2 home record so far this year, and they're going up against Mumbai and KKR. They really want to win both of those, but even if they split them, I think they're doing okay. So the Sunrisers game could be incredibly important for them. The Delhi Capitals this week went 2-1. and one. They had a win versus Gujarat and a win versus Mumbai. And of course, they then got absolutely smashed in the face versus Kolkata. I mean, is this a team that can McGurk their way to a playoff spot? They had one win in their first five games and they have now won four of their last six. And let's be honest, they have accidentally ended up with a good side here, but there is something going forward. And then the KKR game happens. I mean, you could make, you could make an argument that their best batter in that game was Cool Deep, who is also their best bowler. Their power play batting has been good, and that sounds kind of ridiculous because of the McGurk nature of this. But in the first five matches, they were averaging 32 runs and a strike rate of 141 in the first six overs. They actually averaged 30 after that, but at a strike rate of 183. If we look at that individually, McGurk has 195 runs and a strike rate of 257 in the power play. Shaw has an average of 159, and even Warner had an average of 146 in the power play. Their middle overs have been poor. Pants has faced a huge chunk of the deliveries for Delhi, scoring 284 runs, an average of 47 and 145, and that is sensational. Unfortunately, their second biggest run scorer is Tristan Stubbs, and he's averaging 23 in that middle period, no one else has really made any runs there. Their death banning has been above par because after Stubbs gets a little bit stuck in those middle overs, he's going berserk at the end. He has 152 runs of 52 deliveries without being dismissed. And when Pant has got to the end, he scored 88 runs at a strike rate of 244 as well. Their upcoming fixtures are versus Rajasthan at RCB and then versus Lucknow. They have to win every game from here on in to feel safe for a playoff spot. They play two good sides, but they play both of them at home. They play RCB, and who knows what RCB is doing at the moment, and that one is away. You can easily see them winning two of these three with a combination of McGurk and Cool Deep. Can they win all three? Probably not. Gujarat Titans, they went 0-2. and two. They lost at DC, and they lost versus RCB. And I'm going to be honest, I've kind of lost a lot of faith in them, only because I thought if they had any major skill, it was clamping down from over 6 through to 20. Well, Rashid Khan is not bowling as well as he has in other seasons. Noor Ahmed has kind of dropped off quite a bit. And Mohit Sharma is currently bowling roughly how I think I would. And it's, it's also just their inability to take wickets as well. They took one wicket against the RCB. And the bigger questions are certainly about their bowling, but their batting is still very one-paced. How many teams in this tournament can they blow out of the water with their batting? Which means that they have to be able to take wickets or completely clamp down. And neither of those look possible at the moment. Their power play batting has been poor. Last season, Gil had been averaging 89 with strike rate of 151 in the power play that has dropped to an average of 41 and 127 in 2024 so I said Arshin, who they really don't want to come in early in the power play, has had to do it a lot. And of course, when he's in the power play, he usually scores quite slowly at 124. Saha is supposed to be their pinch hitter or their attacking opener, and he just can't make any runs at all. The bad news is it actually gets worse in the middle overs. Their overall record in that period is averaging 21 with a strike rate of 100. That's really, really bad especially considering that Sadarshan has been incredible, averaging 44 at a strike rate of 138. But Gil keeps going out, and they're using Miller as like a middle overs anchor, and he's doing okay at that role. But is that what you want David Miller for? And everyone else who's batted in the middle overs for them has been terrible. They used Abhishek Sharma last game, and that worked. I really like that thinking. Their death overs have been par. Rahul Tuatia has been the main person in the final overs. He scored 122 runs at a strike rate of 188. Miller has scored 66 runs for two outs at a strike rate of 220. And Rashid Khan is doing Rashid Khan things. Not smashing it quite as much as other years, but he's got a strike rate of 174. Their death batting has been really, really good, but it can't make up for, like, everything else. Their upcoming fixtures are at RCB and then home games versus CSK and KKR. They are four and six. So every game from here on in is basically almost an eliminator. The way this tournament is going, it is possible a team might actually qualify with seven wins. But the chances are you're going to need eight. And so they're going to have to win pretty much every other game. So coming up against CSK and KKR, even if it is at home, is not ideal. The Mumbai Indians lost two games this week on the road versus Rajasthan and Delhi Capitals. That's largely because their bowling attack, except for Bumrah, is not actually a bowling attack. It's... 
a, a bowling leak. Yeah, power play batting has been very good. Rohit Sharma has given some really quick starts. He scored 194 runs, an average of 49 and 170 in the power play. And Kishan has been averaging 29, but with a strike rate of 166. And when Sky's come in, he's averaging 161 as well. And all of them are averaging like 29 plus. Their middle overs has been good. Tilak Varma is just incredibly consistent, right? Hardik Pandya has been a bit of an issue, but it looks like he's finally rounding into form. Sky is smashing the ball everywhere in the middle overs. And of course, the person dragging them down a little bit has been Rohit as he struggled to score quickly against the spinners in the middle overs. At the moment, that is probably more important for India than is the Indians. Their death batting has been quite poor. When Tim David can come in, but now teams are holding spin because they don't want him to face pace, he has managed to score 129 runs, averaging 22 at a strike rate of 205. We also saw Romario Shepard go absolutely nuts. But Hardik Pandya has scored 40 runs off 28 balls at the death. So overall, it's still a negative for them. Their upcoming fixtures are at LSG and then versus KKR and Sunrisers. Those are three kind of tricky games. And qualification was probably already beyond them, right? But if you're a spoiler team, and Mumbai are definitely a spoiler team, you could make a mess of a couple of sides ahead of you right now. If you beat LSG and the Sunrisers, you are just pouring kerosene on this entire IPL. RCB had two wins this week at Sunrisers and at Gujarat. Rajit Padadar, Will Jackson, even Cameron Green all looked really good at times. And Virat Kohli and Mohamed Siraj have picked up some form. None of this probably matters and will actually be maybe more annoying to some of their fans. The power play batting has been par, and when you consider the amount of money that they are spending at the top, that's not ideal. Coley is averaging 81 at a strike rate of 154 in the power play. So, you know, that's quite good. The, but Faf is scoring at roughly the same rate, but being dismissed an average of 28. Their average power play score is 55 runs off the bat for one and a half wickets. They either need to be faster or losing fewer wickets, and they're kind of in the middle at the moment. Their middle overs is above par. Coley has faced the most deliveries for them in this phase, scoring 214 runs at 54 and 137 strike rate. But Rajit Padadar has had the most impact. He's been striking 185, and I think he looks absolutely fantastic. And Dinesh Kartik, when he's had to come in in this part of the game, is also doing really well with a strike rate of 156. This is obviously the part of the game they really want Maxwell and Jax to completely take over. But if Jax and Padadar can be those guys, that's more than good enough. Their death batting has been poor, which is kind of weird because Kartik has been incredible. He's averaging 32 with a strike rate of 231 at the death. About 162 runs. And yet the rest of the batters combined have 222 runs, an average of 13, and a strike rate of 159. Dinesh cannot do it all, my brothers. Their upcoming games versus Gujarat, at Punjab, and versus Delhi. These games could be a good indicator for them to actually start to look ahead a little bit. Do they want Will Jacks to open? Do they still need Faf Duplessis at the top of the order? What are their views on Glenn Maxwell? What's the best position for Rajat Padadar? Are there young bowlers they can give a go to? I really think it would be a waste if they're not already planning for next year. And at the moment, they don't really seem to be doing that. The Punjab Kings had one win this week versus KKR, and they pulled off the highest chase in T20 history. Johnny Bairstow scored a 45 ball ton. Prab Simran went absolutely ballistic, and Shashank scored 68 of 28 in what was just a run fest at Eden Garden. Their power play batting has been below par. Prab Simran has been probably their best batter at the start. He's averaging 40 with a strike rate of 165. Bairstow now has a good record but obviously was dropped in the middle of this darwin has been injured and not been particularly good and sam curran i don't even know what they're doing with him at the top but it has not worked the middle overs has been par ashatosh sharma and shashank singh have done a great job for punjab the issue is that jitesh sharma and sam curran have really dragged them down and their death batting has been pretty good again it's shashank and ashatosh those two players have been absolute revelation their upcoming games are home and away versus csk and then versus rcb I've obviously got them really low, even though they had a fantastic win in the last game. But it's mostly because I expect, if they have any fit players left, to be able to win both of those games against them. But I should point out, even if I've got them really low on this list, I actually think the bottom four teams, perhaps, are all fairly similar. And all of them can beat teams all the way up until Rajasthan. Well, this is our IPL power list. And if you agree with these selections, you're as sick and broken as I am. How about telling me what your list would be in the comments or just getting my face tattooed on your butt? Or you could just comment, like, and subscribe. Attack all these options like you're a Sunrisers Southpaw slogger. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know deaths. I've been using deaths for years. I'm a collector of deaths, old and new, and I am sitting on a new one right now. I am the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit, this is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. 
This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen and it has under desk cable management. But really the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore. Even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings.